Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session of the Permit COE webinar series. Today, Mariano Vázquez is going to talk about supercomputer-based ba super modeling and simulation for advanced biomedical applications. My name is Daniel Tomás López. I am involved in Permit COE on behalf of Embelli BI, and I am going to host this webinar. Before starting, I would like to make you aware that this webinar is being recorded, including the questions and answers section, and that the recording will be disseminated afterwards. After the presentation, we will have time for questions. So please use the Q&A button in your Zoom panel for asking questions during the webinar. Please note that all materials are licensed under a CC BY 4.0 license, except where further licensing details are provided. Let me introduce the project Permit COE. It's the HPC Exascale Center of Excellence for Personalized Medicine in Europe. Permit COE focuses on simulation of cellular mechanistic models, which are essential to translate the omics data into medical actions. The performance of cell simulation software is still not enough nowadays to address problems such as tumor evolution or finding personalized treatments uh, for patients. So Permit COE will scale up the software for cell simulations to the present HPC exascale systems in order to enable the creation of models of cellular functions with medical relevance. Permit COE will achieve this goal through a series of objectives. First, it's going to optimize cell-level simulation software to run in the pre scale platforms. Second, Permit COE is developing a series of use cases that will showcase the applications of the, the project products in different fields of clinical interest, such as drug synergies for cancer treatment or performing multi-scale modeling of COVID-19 virus and patient's tissue. Additionally, the project also has as objectives training the biomedical professionals in the use of these tools, integrating the permit communities into the HPC European Exascale ecosystem, and building the sustainability, the basis for the sustainability of the permit COE. Let me now introduce our speaker. Mariano Vázquez is CTO, CSO of the company Ellen Biotech, which develops and commercializes supercomputer-based applications for the biomedical sector. And he's also a researcher of the Barcelona Compute Supercomputing Center, from which LM spun off in 2018. He has a PhD from the Technical University of Catalonia, UPC, with postdocs in the Salt Aviation and in Indria Sofia Antipolis in France. So Mariano, the floor is yours. All right. So thank you very much. I guess. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, well, what I'm going to First of all, thanks a lot to PermitGo for allowing me to introduce, to present you uh, this seminar. Um, my company, LM Biotech, is, the, is part of Permit COE. It's one of the uh, uh, core partners of the of the of the project. Um, so the this seminar is going to be about the virtual human twins, which is the future of medicine. What I like to always say is that this is the future of medicine now. It is something that it is happening now, and it is uh, right now we are kind of the living proof that this is happening because our company is selling uh, products and services around this. So it is it is something that it is it is really really happening. So I like to to show that the future has come. Um, I I present this with a like a sort of pyramid. So at the lower floor of the pyramid is Marinostrum 4, which is our supercomputer in in BSC. Um, it is a very large one. Uh, right now we are at the this is the fourth edition of the computer, and we are installing the fifth edition of the computer. So very soon I will change the picture and the and the and the figures. Um, this very large computer is hosted by BSC, Barcelona Supercomputing Center. So it's, this is at the next floor of the pyramid. The BSC today is kind of almost 700 researchers. It's a Spanish public center. And it was founded in, in, in 2005. Uh, the same year that we found the next, that, that it was, uh, that we started the next uh, floor of the pyramid, uh, which is, Alia, the Alia development team. So this is a team which develops a code, uh, which is called Alia. I will talk about this later. It is more than 60 researchers. It is right now it is kind of 65. 
uh, of all kinds, mathematician, physicists, engineers. And it was born at the same time as BSc was born. We started being two. Now we are 60, 65. So uh, we've been pretty successful in, in gathering money from uh, the private sector, but also and a lot from the from Europe and, and Spain for the public sector. And at the top of the pyramid is LM. LM is the spin of company from BSC. So BSC is part of the company that we created uh, in 2018. Uh, and the idea is that our code is used at different verticals. So the company is a is the company was created to speed up the technology transfer from the center um, to put the, these tools in the hands of those that really need it. And it was created for the biomedical uh, vertical. So we develop biomedical software technology um, and you will see a bit of it in the in the future. So this is at the very top of the, of the pyramid. So what is a virtual human? This is the important thing from the very beginning. So the question is, is a digitized movie of Marilyn Monroe, a virtual human of Marilyn Monroe? Well, uh, no. Um, this is just patient's data set, like Marilyn's data set. Um, now, what is a virtual human of Marilyn Monroe? Would be um, a patient data set plus a computer model. It is not just a collection of, of data, but it is just a computer model that can be used to predict as opposed to measuring experimentally some quantity of quantities of interest that we that we we design the the virtual human to predict these quantities of interest specifically and which also is used to support decision making within a given specific of specific context of, of use in healthcare so it is not general in a sense that it it will not um allow us to predict anything that we want to be used in any context of use no it is only for some specific context of use and some specific quantities of interest. So this is the virtual human or a digital twin in healthcare, which is something that it is right now, it is, is, uh, there are plenty of discussions around it. Uh, which is the challenge, the technical challenge is to, we want to recreate a biological systems in a computer. Now, the more complex the system, the larger the computer you need, but, there is a problem with that is that the larger the computer, the more efficient the code. Um, so if you, this means that if you want to create a code for, for creating this virtual human twin, uh, it's going to be, the computations are going to be very expensive. So you will need a large computer and the more complex, the larger the computer, but you need to write an efficient code. And these codes are in order to take the most of these uh, of these computers, you need to write it very carefully and with this specific objective in mind. So what we are developing here is a virtual humans platform. This is what we our goal. So combining these three things: first of all, a supercomputing efficiency, as I said before, in order to use large scale uh, computing facilities, then accurate multi scale multi physics modeling. Uh, something that can allow you to simulate very complex problems and also a virtual population generation. Uh, this is very important. This third one is very important because it will allow you to create virtual humans in which you can, on, on which you can test a given therapy. So by combining the three things, what we are going to have is a supercomputer based in silico clinical trials uh, platform to optimize and personalize the different medical therapies. In, in, in it, the user can select the population, select the primary disease, select the comorbidities, uh, and select the treatment. So there you launch, the, the user can launch the supercomputer based in silico clinical trial on this specific virtual cohort. Then the user should wait from days to weeks, depending on the tests. Um, I, I like to be pretty conservative and this, does not mean that each of the simulation can take days or weeks, which means uh, what I'm meaning is that you are going to run many simulations because it's, it's going to run, you're going to run the simulations for a cohort. So to be, I prefer to be pretty conservative and say that this will take from days to weeks. But if you think about real clinical trials that can take years, it's affordable. 
Uh, then you, the user can analyze the results as they come and then repeat uh, changing things of the of the clinical trial. Which are the use? Who are the users of this? Well, first of all, medical device manufacturers, pharmaceutical companies, and CROs. These can be users, and in fact, they are um, because they are among our customers. Then regulatory bodies, the regulatory these uh, tools will we expect that these tools will have regulatory interest. Um, and finally, of course, healthcare professionals, and finally, finally, patients. So it's something that right now we are developing this uh, platform for customers, but at a certain point, we would like really to put this in the hands of the, of the healthcare professionals and finally the patients. Of course, we, we have a, a high interest of the healthcare professionals in what we're doing, and, and we have uh, medical doctors in the in the in our board in our company as collaborators so it is like the doctors are those that are really uh, are asking the questions that we should that we should uh, answer a bit of a background um alia is a parallel multi scale simulation code that we that was born and is being developed in in Mare Nostrum, in sorry in barcelona supercomputing center and now in also in lm uh, the fact is that it is well. It is um, uh, the the company is fully devoted to the biomedical vertical, but the code is also applied in other verticals like aerospace, energy, environment. And this is, for instance, an example of a project that we have on a on a wind field. Um, it is important to say that it is not that we are smarter than others. Uh, but we have a very stringent condition for anything that we develop. As it was born in a supercomputing center, then we need to make it efficient. So it is the only multi-physics, multi-scale code of its kind for biomedical sector that was born and developed in a supercomputing center. That's why uh, everything that we need must run efficiently in these large facilities. Um, what's the goal of, of all these? Well, um, uh, this is a vision of the FDA, the regulatory body of, of the American regulatory body, which is, which is a kind of a powerhouse of these sort of uh, applications. Um, so at this at this point, until very recently, you have that any project, any product that should have uh, that should go through a regulatory process, you have to make these tests, laboratory, human, animal, and a bit of computer related things. But all this is changing very rapidly. The vision that they have is that we always are going to have laboratory, animal, and human, at least for the for the few years to come. But this computer part is going to be much, much larger. And you will see this new um, this new thing here, which is the virtual patient. This virtual patient is indeed a complexity, represents indeed a complexity boost. Because in, in here, what you would like to model is not just the isolated therapy, but modeling the therapy on the patient. So you need to take into account many things. That's why it's most multi-scale and multi-physics. You need, you need to take into account a, a system, organ, tissue, cell. Um, this implies this comprehensive modeling because you have to take into account the comorbidities of the patient, the patient variability, Etc. And and it requires, of course, and this should represent a, another talk, a very long one, discussing all these things in B1 experimental validation for the different context of use. So this is why this virtual patient is indeed a complexity boost. So when we started to develop uh, to develop these tools based on Alia for biomedical, which has give as as we just play in. Um, give a, a funny name, but then this name just remain. It is, uh, we group all these bi biomedical application with a color, red. So these Alia Red are simulation tools for biomedical research. As I said, the goal is to run this in silico clinical trials. We are very focused on organ and tissue levels. So we are not doing molecular dynamics. So this is uh, at, the, at the, or cell uh, simulation. So this goes at the, at the organ and tissue level. We are very focused on cardiovascular uh, and respiratory, but uh, we are, I'm, I'm going to show you um, an, a few more applications and examples of a few more applications. And it is for pharma, medtech, as I said, as I said before. 
different domain. I will give you a few examples and I will start by cardiovascular system. Um, for the cardiovascular system, there is a, well, for, for anything, you, you will need a, some magic to create a virtual humans database. So what we do is we have a, a data from a patient's database, which is coming from different of our partners. In this case, this is coming from the virtual uh, visible human lab of the University of Minnesota. So what they have is this is uh, this uh, anatomies, high definition anatomies of, of hearts, of female, male, and children of this patient database. And the idea is that uh, with, with a, a bit of, of magic, with a uh, well, it is not magic, but it is our our thing. Uh, for, with mathematical and computational modeling, what we can do is we can create a virtual patient's database based on the original database. So what we do is kind of a continuum a variation between the different individuals, each of these, uh, but this variation must represent uh, realizable hearts. So they are they should represent real hearts of patients. And with that, we can create hundreds or thousands of um, heart patients, which are representing a population uh, and this is basing the original population that we have so we have if we have a female population then we can have a female uh, virtual population uh, and we have female male children this is to study health disease and and treatment so just to give you an idea of the complexity for us the the heart from the engineering viewpoint first of all you have to solve a set of equations that represent the electrophysiology propagation in which you have two parts. One part is the tissue and another part is the cell model. So these two are combined to have the proper electrophysiology propagation. Then this is coupled to mechanical action because you know the heart is a muscle, so it contracts and, and, and then um, as it is relaxed, it expands. Uh, so this go through an electromechanical coupling between the electrophysiology and the mechanics. And then you have blood flow. So this blood flow is coming from is the, the blood that it is coming in and out of the heart through the veins and arteries, but also the blood inside the inside the, the cavities of the heart, the ventricles and the and the atria. And then what is uh, what would differentiate us of an engineering problem or uh, traditional problem is that you have anatomy and physiology to include to your, to your model. As I like to say, God, uh, nature, nature is not a CAD user. So you cannot have directly the CAD. If we, if we are talking about an aircraft, the engineer can produce a CAD file. And with this CAD file, you can generate your mesh and establish your simulation scenario. But the problem is that with, the, with, the, with, the, with biology, you cannot. So you have to create your own CAD. And this CAD is coming in this case from images. So in, and in each, you have to, to include all the anatomy and physiology that, that you need uh, to give um, the proper sense to your, to your model. And then you have to analyze the results, which are this, and these results are, are analyzed in a very specific way, depending on the, on the case you are solving, and then validate and, and verify what you do. Uh, what is interesting here, and also departs from the engineering, re, in, traditional engineering viewpoint is that in a in an with in, in an, the a model of an aircraft that is in a wind tun, wind tunnel, you can put your ga your gauges wherever you want, and measure the pressure or the velocity wherever you want. But in a patient, you can't do the same. So you need to uh, you need to pick very carefully which are the results that you would that you will use to compare with the with your simulation. Uh, this represents a very difficult, as I said, a very difficult, a very challenging way of validate and verify. Uh, and then what you are doing is going to um, to specify the context of use. Or what are the kind of things that you? What are, what is the situation of your of your system? And then the the quantities of interest. What are the the, the quantities that you are going to that you are going to measure? Uh, this is an. I, I will start by to give you some examples uh, from now on until the end of the of the talk, so you can have a better idea of what I'm talking about. Um, the um, we have this. Uh, for instance, we have this human cardiac in silico clinical trial. 
for cardiac safety assessment. Cardiac safety of drugs means that uh, when you take a medicine, when you when you take a drug, um, it can eventually produce some uh, arrhythmic um, side effect. Uh, and uh, this is the first, so this is related to the cardiac safety of the of the treatment. This is something that it is always tested for drugs before going into market. Uh, you need to check efficacy, but also safety. So cardiac safety if, is the, the most important of the different uh, safeties that you have to, to test. So with our model, what we do is we administer a drug with a given, and, and we need as an input a few um, a few values coming from the from the drug from the from the laboratory. Then we can create a population, for instance, a thirty-two female population or an, and a thirty-two male population. And then with what we do is we run the different cases from this population and we measure the what is the arrhythmic risk classification. So one of the biomarkers to check the arrhythmic uh, the arrhythmic risk risk is how the electrophysiology, how the electrocardiogram is uh, altered. So one way is to measure the how this electrocardiogram, electrocardiogram is elongated, which is called the QT prolongation. QT is one of the measures of the duration of the, of the cardiac cycle. And if you observe some QT prolongation, then you can think that your drug can be, um, can, can have some risk. So this is a, a an, an example of this of the kind of validation that we can that we can perform. So here to the left, uh, you see we have created this population, virtual population. We have administered to this population one drug, which is called moxifloxacin. And then what we what we do is we observe, depending on the depending on the um, on the dosage of the doses, uh, on the do so dosage of the drug, plasma dosage, we observe the QT prolongation. So what is important here is to measure the slope of this plot. So which means that with more dosage, more QT prolongation. Um, so this is the result, the blue one is the result that we obtained from our population. And the gray one is the results that it was obtained and published from a real uh, clinical trial. So we've seen that the slopes are, are very, very similar. And, and we are, since the, the first time that we see this result, we were really uh, astonished by how, uh, how wonderful the model behaves because we are kind of capturing the slope. But we did this not just for one uh, drug, we did it for many drugs. And this is an example of another one that we tested for different drugs. For instance, moxifloxacin is ant antibiotic. Antibiotic, this is another drug I, um, for cancer. I cannot tell which one, but it is another drug for cancer in which we measured also the cardiotoxicity of the drug. And again, you see that the slope is more or less the same within, within the dosage um, interval that we want to study. So it is more or less the same uh, if you compare with the clinical trial. What is interesting is that, for instance, we did this for some drugs that are that those days were administered for COVID. So this was during the pandemic, and we test uh, also the combination of two different drugs. We tested for hydroxychloroquine, acitromycin, uh, and chloroquine, but also with the com with the combination of hydroxychloroquine and acit acitromycin. In here, the way of of measuring there were not so many data published those days but and and it was a different way of measuring uh, of measuring the result of the clinical trial so it is like this um um the the popul population uh, which can uh, to, to which the drug can affect so it is they define a margin and then then, they, then define the ratio of the population affected or not or not and we obtain very similar um figures to the uh, clinical trial data only, but we, we test it only in the case that we have access to the to the data because the data was not uh, so abundant. Uh, but in any case, we test it for different, different drugs. And again, what we see is that our model can predict pretty well the behavior of the, the cardiac uh, safety of drugs. 
Moreover, what we can do is not just to predict the risk and by studying the QT prolongation, but to really observe the arrhythmia when it is produced. So this is a, an arrhythmic behavior that we observe in one heart. So this is a biventricular ge geometry of the kind of the geometries that we use for the, for the test. But in, in this case, we pick the geometry and we observe it. And we observe how this, uh, how this um, electrical uh, activity is propagated. So in this, I will not explain why, but um, it, it is related to the, to the fact that this red wave from the very beginning, it started from the two ventricles, and here it is coming, and, and afterwards it is coming only from the from the left. This means that you have a block of, of the conduction system of the heart, uh, so which is called LBBB, left bundle branch block, uh, which is in this case is produced in a in a female subject after the administration of a given amount of hydroxychloroquine. So this is these effects are published also so for for patients. So we were really very happy that that we can not just measure this, but also with high high uh, dosages we can really observe this behavior. We can really observe the arrhythmia. Uh, okay. So the goal here was to determine the cardiac security dosage margin of a drug for a given type of patient. So, so we, we define our cohort, our patient, and with that, we try to determine the, the cardiac uh, safety or the security dosage margin of a drug. Then this is another, another beautiful example. In this case, what you see is that, you know, our, as I said, depending on the context of use and the quantities of interest that we want to measure, we can um, we can start or stop the code. The code is very modular, so we can start or stop different modules. In this case, we have all the modules uh, started, which is the um, electrophysiology, mechanical contraction, and fluid mechanics. In this in this case, what we wanted to study is to uh, this is the control heart. This is only systole, so the the heart is contracted. And the flow if is pumped out, the valves are fully open. The two valves are fully open. Two valves are fully closed, and we want to observe the the pump the pumping action of the of the heart. So we have this this heart, which is a control, and the one to the right is the heart is a heart now, which is a it is deceased. So we produce here a left bundle branch block, very similar to the other one that 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 we observe in the other heart, and we place here. A pacemaker. So this light, sudden spark that you see here is the pacemaker. So we desist the heart and we put the pacemaker. And what we did is we changed the synchronization in order to see if we can recover the cardiac function, which is shown. It is uh, described in this table. So we try to see if by this CRT 10, 40, 80, is CRT means cardiac resynchronization therapy. So changing different synchron different synchronizations. We observed that we started to recover <laughs> the left ventricle ejection fraction and the left ventricle uh, end of systole volume. Um, we did this also for a different kind of pacemaker. This pacemaker is called Micra. It's a very sophisticated one in which uh, which goes pinned inside the right ventricle. So this is everything. Here you have the battery. This is the pacemaker with the battery, with the, the all the chips and the electric thing. It is here. It is here. So this goes pins to the right, right ventricle. So what the what our collaborator wanted to study was the forces in the in the micro. So if there are some forces moving the moving the micro, you 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 know you don't want to that this thing get loose in your system. So you want this to be to be very well fixated and also uh, transferring the electrical impulse to the to the heart in the proper way. So this is was this is studying the forces, but also choose where to put this micra in order again to recover the the cardiac function. Um, next example is this one. This is uh, also for CRT cardiac resynchronization therapies. So what we are doing here is to try to validate what we are doing. 
And in order to validate what we what we did is we we have data from 20 patients from the San Pau Hospital here in Barcelona. So for these patients, we create the digital twin of, of, the, of the 20 patients and we run simulations on them and we fine tune these simulations for the uh, patient. So with no treatment, we fine tune the simulation in order to more or less uh, adapt the model to the patient. And then what we do, once it is adapted, we perform the virtual treatment on them, just placing the pacemaker and see if we can more or less have the same results like the, like the population, that, like the virtual twins. But moreover, what we have done is using our, our models, and as I said before, we got these 20 patients' uh, geometries. And for these 20 patient geometries, we create, uh, we expand this to uh, 100 patients. And so these 100 patients are virtual ones. The interesting point of this one, new 100 patients is that eventually one of these patients can be the digital twin of Marilyn Monroe. Even if Marilyn is not here in the original ones, then by creating this database, you can pinpoint one of these uh, patients to one of a, to a, to a real patient. And so in this case, what we would like to go is following this path, we can go to something that it is more patient specific. Um, so with this very large uh, synthetic virtual population, we can test the, the therapy and we can test really what happened to a patient that is very uh, similar to you, very similar to the to a real one. So to a real one, which is not in the original population, I mean. Uh, so the goal here is to select the best pacemaker therapy for a given type of, of arrhythmia, arrhythmia patient. We do other things. For instance, uh, there is this uh, very, uh, extreme, I would say, medical device. This extreme medical device, it's what is called a left ventricular assist device. So this is a, something, this is a pump that it is put for in the, in the heart of a real, of a living person, it is put this pump. Uh, and this pump is there to help the patient to, uh, to pump the, the blood. And this is out of, in and out of the heart. This is a, for patients with have a, very advanced heart failure um, and that are ready for a heart transplant. Um, so here what we did is we produce again, plenty of patients. And we, in this case, it was great because we have, um, we are, what we are reproducing here is not a real patient, but an experiment of a, of a patient. So it is a silicon a heart that it is placed in, a, in an experimental experimental facility. And what we wanted to do here is to try to uh, reproduce the behavior of this experimental facility of the fluid flow inside the inside the ventricles. So we created this database and we created this uh, this uh, we observed the sensitivity of the model and see that the sensitivity of the model was was very similar to the sensitivity of, of the experimental one and in this way validate the the model. This is for another complex thing in here this is a, a prosthetic valve. So here we are simulating a valve that it is a that it a prosthetic valve, a bioprosthetic valve that it is placed in the in in the aorta for the aortic valve of a of a real patient. So here what we would like to what we want to see is the the production of this is similar also to to the other cases, to the case of the micra, to the case of the ventricular assist device. Something that it is very important when you implant a medical device like this one is that this medical device is not promoting throm the for thrombus formation. So there are some biomarkers that can help you to, uh, to identify if there is a risk of a thrombus formation. So in this case, the, the, the goal is to measure, to compute these biomarkers and check which are in which conditions you can observe this thrombus, uh, this thrombogenicity. Uh, so we, we, we change the, the, we change the, how this valve is positioned, uh, the type of the patient, like the size and, and the, and the morphology of the, of the um, aorta, um, the, what it is called the ellipticity, that is how, if the valve, when it is placed, is deformed or not, is losing this circularity and getting more elliptic. And with all this, we measure this uh, 
we measure these biomarkers typically um, behind or downstream the, the valve. Also, we change the material of the, we can change the material of the, of the valve, the rigidity of the materials, uh, the model, uh, many, many things on, on it. So the goal here is that for these structural heart-related therapies, like the massive heart failure, but also with the valves replacement, select the best valves or assist device therapy for a given type of, of, of patient uh, also. Um, just an example of the respiratory system. So here in the respiratory system, when I put here the collaborators, it is not, the idea is not that you read it. The idea is that you see that in the collaborators we have, um, this is important. It is not only academic, it is also healthcare institutions, companies, uh, academic. Uh, so there are plenty of different uh, stakeholders here and also regulatory bodies that are collaborators of us and, and, and these sort of things. So what we are doing here is uh, the features is that here again, it's a very complex problem. Um, so you need to run these uh, large scale models of the respiratory ways and, the, and all the bronchial tree. For instance, this is a picture of a bronchial tree, synthetic bronchial tree that we created uh, up to 25 uh, bifurcations. So it is a large one. Um, and and this will produce, of course, tons of uh, analytical, uh, tons of uh, uh, data to be uh, um, analyzed. And this is with this also we can produce a different. Uh, we can create a population of this respiratory system, just not for oral nebulizers, but also for uh, nasal nebulizers. So talking about nasal um, um, inhalers. This is one, one example. Uh, so here, this is a patient coming from the one of our partners in, in Imperial College. Uh, so you will see a very nice picture here, but what is important to say is that uh, this movie is made with, uh, with cartoon techniques, but it is based on our simulation. So it is not just uh, some particles moving around. No, this is coming from our simulations. So here, what we are doing is trying to study the particle deposition of the of the of this inhaler. So we we make this patient to inhale, and we we put different particles of different size, and we study how these particles are deposited in the in the system uh, of the of the patient. For depending on the sizes, for instance, if you want to study asthma, you need the part or COPD, you need the particles to go to different places. Uh, so that's why it is in, important. It is important also the the inhaler design, the part sizes of the particle, the patient, the way the patient it inhales, the 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 morphology of the respiratory system. So there are plenty of things that we can study. Then. So the goal here is to select the best device for a given type of respiratory disease patient. So it is again a very, very similar goal. It, goal. it is also, it is only, it is always to check that the that the therapy is is the good one for a given uh, type of patient. And I would like to show this one as a last example, which we call Alia Purple, uh, which is the virtual pregnancy lab. This is our collaborators here at the Washington University in St. Louis. Um, this is a, a pure R&D project. We'll see in the future if we can really uh, transform this in a, in a product. And the idea is that what using just the same, the, using the same model that we use for the heart, because the uterus, it is also, it is also a, a, a muscle as the heart. So by just, uh, by just tweaking a bit the heart model, we can reproduce the uh, contractions of a, of a uterus, of a pregnant woman. So the, the goal here is, to, I, I, will, I will tell you about the, the goal now, but what is interesting here is that uh, with the, our colleagues from the Washington University, they have a, a, a fantastic way of uh, measuring the electro, electromechanical activity of the contraction of a pregnant woman. Uh, and given that the model is, there are plenty, it is our preliminary results and the model must be improved. The first uh, comparison with the, 
first comparison with the with the experiments are really pretty pretty good so they are very very similar now the goal here is is to design better medicines to induce labor of pregnant pregnant women but you can imagine that the that the that the possibilities are really large so just to finish uh, kind of a pictorial conclusion is that this is our vision of the human digital twin so all the things that you see here are things that we are working on in our in our team in lm and in bsc for instance i i didn't speak about the cerebrospinal fluid but it is something that we are doing and the intervertebral disc um intervertebral disc also i i couldn't speak about them because i i had not enough time but it is also something that we do so the final goal is at certain points you have some kind of uh try to well go in step by step integrating the different parts of the body in order to have a um a full human digital twin of course this is a long way and and it will take a long time to go there but it is in the direction that we are that we are going uh, just by adding up the 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 different contributions uh so yes this was my last slide so thank you thanks a lot for for your attention Thank you very much, Mariano. Uh, definitely very, very impressive, everything that it's possible to do. Okay, so um, uh, please, uh, everyone, feel free to ask any questions. You can use the Q&A button that it's in your uh, Zoom panel to ask any questions you may have. Um, while questions come in, uh, well, I had, I had a few questions myself. Um, but what I wanted to ask is, like, here is like, the field of medical sciences and the field of computing science that I don't know traditionally they have been very separated and they totally merge. And do you see? Have you seen like that any barriers there? Like because people come from that professionals come from very mm. different fields, like to understand each other or communicate with each mm. other or collaborate. Yes, this is very interesting because it is some something that many times it is just kept the languages are very different so it is very difficult to communicate uh, among us um, um but but this is the this is the problem with with multidisciplinary it's like uh, the governments and europe are always uh, asking us to develop multidisciplinary projects but they sometimes skip this thing and the thing is you need really to train yourself and to to help uh, the other parties to train themselves also to try to find a common language so this common language definition is something that it is not already done and uh, for us what was really very good is to find uh, doctors that very smart doctors very curious and very that they have a tendency to this sort of things and and they were very good in we've been learning together Mm -hmm. um, also, what is interesting is that these kind of tools are we we've been talking with a medical device company and pharmaceutical companies. So medical device company are much easier to discuss with because in the medical device companies there are engineers, so the, the communication is easier. With the pharmaceutical uh, industry is more difficult. They try it is it is more difficult to understand each other what we do. But finally, after years. Uh, now we are having good good communication also with pharma. Uh, the important thing is that you can show an example of something that they really need, and you understood that they need it, and and you kind of adapt it to to them to the necessities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely an example. I think it it really helps for someone to understand what it's done if it's not your your field of expertise. Yes. Um, great. Uh, we have a question: Is the virtual human method to predict biological responses? more reliable than organ on a chip devices this is very very interesting uh, because from my point of view that they are, they are totally complementary and i remember a few years ago um i wrote a proposal for a project it wasn't uh, uh wasn't a uh, wasn't successful but i was reading a, a project in i i wrote a project in which what we what we proposed was to have a platform that it is an organ on a chip and, and virtual human uh, combined. So first of all, the virtual human can be used 
to improve how you design your organ on a chip. So you can go through a design cycle in which mm. you simulate and we create your platform, simulate, improve, simulate, improve, simulate, improve. So for, for this, I think it is very good as for any kind of engineering thing. But in this case, it is interesting thing is that in this engineering case, uh, uh, you have tissue there, uh, living tissue. And secondly, what I, what I think is that for a, a second very good thing is that uh, with with organ on a chip we can control a lot the experiment so we can measure things that can be used to improve a lot our computational model and thirdly by operating these two things together we can make that the that the organ on a chip uh, um, experiments can be much more uh, pinpoint to the problem that you would like to that you would like to solve so i think that they are totally complementary mm -hmm. mm -hmm. great thank you for that answer another question can you explain on what principles are these supercomputer simulations based on any theoretical method uh, well yes it as as i for instance i will take the the example of the heart which i described at the very beginning so electrophysiology is based, well, it is based on many papers. Uh, it is our own experience also, but it is based on many papers. Um, so there is a corpus of, of development all these years and validated of different, with validation of different kinds. So electrophysiology is simulated as a, the mathematical model is a diffusion equation with a, with some nonlinear, adding some nonlinear terms. Uh, which represent the cell model. So the diffusion equation represents the tissue and the propagation along the tissue. And the cell model represents the electrical activity of each of the, at, at the different points of the heart. Then this is coupled to a mechanical and the mechanical is the traditional um, solid mechanics uh, mathematical simulation. In this case, the model, the, the, the material model is a something, is a, is a model of tissue, uh, which is called, Holds up a log then model, so it is a model that is, it is well known and it is used for tissue, but with a, a particularity which is a combination of active and passive tissue. So the passive the passive part of the tissue represent all the well represent the tissue that it is not uh, electrically activated. The part of the tissue which is not electrically activated, and the active parts represent the part of the tissue that it is contracting, uh, thanks to the electrical propagation. And then the fluid mechanics is the traditional Navier-Stokes uh, solution problem, uh, which is coupled to in the in the through the walls. What is interesting here is that everything is developed in our code in Alia, but for running the the problem, what we do is, is we run different instances of Alia that uh, start at, and are automatically connected one with the other uh, in an efficient way. And and we solve uh, because this was the best way we this we we after discussions and 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 experience we we found that this is the best way to do it with these kind of different instances of the code running. Um, I don't know if I answered the question, but I think more or less. Okay, I mean, it seems like an answer, but of course, uh, that MD can always ask back if, if needed. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, I had an, another question. So the, the the stakeholders or users that you mentioned, like uh, you included, for example, regulatory bodies or health healthcare professionals or patients, are do you, have you seen that they are ready to embrace all these predictions, or is it still like reluctancy because it's not like experimentally measured or something? As as you said at the beginning, it's not measuring experimentally; it's more predicting. Do you think that? sometimes that causes a bit of reluctancy or is not really the case yes yes take it it causes a bit of reluctancy so what you need to do when you do these sort of things is put an extra effort on explaining things and also on explaining why uh, which is the degree of confidence so you can't say that these are kind of the definitive way of doing things what you try to do is to to try to establish the the confidence bounds that's why it is very important to define this, uh, to talk about this context of uses or and quant quantities of interest, to show that with these sort of things, you cannot do anything. There is no, um, there is no Swiss blade that can be used to solve 
any kind of cardiac problems. So what you need is to uh, try to validate uh, your code for given situations and to me measuring some specific quantities. Uh, there is uh, some reluctancy, but it is progressively uh, going down once this is interested. And also we, we don't have to forget that the two other things that are used for, for valid, most used things that, that are used for validating any medical product are, first of all, animal experiments, which are apart from being ethically, you can discuss them ethically, but you have to translate these animal experiments to a, to a human body. So the heart of, a, of, of mice is absolutely different than the heart of, of a human. So the animal model is really very bad if you compare. So there, there are some, a lot of uncertainties when you do animal models. And secondly, the other source of validation are clinical trials. And clinical trials, they have plenty of, plenty of uh, variations that you cannot control. Um, so it's, a, it's another method that have some, uh, that have some uh, need for validation. But in any case, it is a much, for me, it is easier to establish the bounds of a computational method because the computational method, the program, the code, and everything that you have done there, that you are doing there, is absolutely controllable. You can control it. Uh, the, the the person you cannot, but in the other cases you cannot control both sides. So in this case, at least one you can control one side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good point. Very good point. Okay, uh, we still have some time for questions, so please use the the function the button. In the meanwhile, I'm just going to uh, if you can stop sharing your screen, I'm just going to um, share a couple of slides to finish. Okay, so uh, well, yeah, you can still use the button to ask questions. And I just wanted to mention uh, that uh, I mean, if you have enjoyed uh, definitely this webinar about what what can be done in the future, um, we are hosting the Permit COE Summer School in June, where we aim to teach. Uh, how to use some of these uh, tools for for modeling in yeah, for the, uh, different applications. In fact, uh, Mariano is going to be one of the speakers at the summer school. Uh, applications have been extended and they are closing next week, so you still have time. I'm putting the the link in the chat, but of course, if you just go to the Permit CEO website, there you can you can find the uh, the link. So we invite you all to apply. Also. Um, you can visit our website to uh, register for the upcoming webinars. So on the 23rd of March, we will have a webinar about uh, a virtual rheumatoid arthritis synovial fibroblast for this uh, analysis and for identifying drugs. And also save the date because on the 18th of April, we will have a short virtual course uh, of uh, half a day, um, a hands-on course for working with from transcriptomics to mechanistic models of uh, signaling. So um, you can find all the information um, in, on our website coming soon. Okay, so last chance if anyone has any questions. Okay, if not, then uh, I just want to say uh, thank you very much, Mariano, for the presentation. I think it. Personally, I find it quite fascinating what we can do and what we'll be able to do in the future. So um, thank you, Mariano, and thank you, everyone, for attending this session. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Bye. Bye.